include microfinance, the most famous institution, the Grameen Bank, established by Mohammed Yunus in 1976. Microfinance, which is the practice of giving really tiny loans to very poor men and women, usually women, without financial, has become a global panacea for poverty. In the last decade, Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries in the world, plagued by natural disasters and by political instability, has made stunning improvements in human development on measures such as improvement in maternal mortality and infant mortality, universal enrollment of girls in primary schools, near universal enrollment of boys in primary schools, etc., etc., and huge declines in poverty. This has been called the Bangladesh Paradox. And it has been credited, even by the World Bank, to the work of a set of non-governmental organizations or NGOs, including the Grameen Bank. These institutions are known for their microfinance work, but my research shows that they do much more than microfinance. And I think it's time to pay much closer attention to the work of these sorts of organizations. So I should note that we're talking about a quite incredible scale of institutions in Bangladesh. Not nearly as well known as the Grameen Bank, Bangladesh's largest development organization is something called BRAC, which started as a small-scale relief organization in 1972. Today, BRAC serves millions of people. Its healthcare services reach 100 million people in rural Bangladesh. So the scale of these institutions is incredible, and I remember in an interview, the founder of Brock, Fazal Abbott, telling me, if we did anything at a smaller scale, we'd just be tinkering at the periphery, and we're not interested in tinkering. Where in fact, being a citizen, it's not just about the ritual of voting, but it is also about access to substantive democracy, to rights to subsistence and consumption. Now, the idea of this sort of a basic minimum income or a conditional cash transfer would be quite radical in the American context, where in fact support for the poor is seen not as a right, but as fostering dependence. They're deeply concerned with the issue of global poverty. These are the young men and women in our classrooms. They're the ones signing up to make poverty history. They're the ones joining the One Campaign. They are embodiment of what I call the democratization of development. The sense that international development and poverty alleviation may no longer be simply the work of institutions like the World Bank and USAID, it is now everyone's concern. At Berkeley, a new undergraduate minor in global poverty and practice that was established two years ago has become the largest undergraduate minor on campus drawing hundreds of students from a whole range of majors, from engineering to economics, public health to anthropology. The class I teach in the fall on global poverty has outgrown every classroom we have. We had about 1,200 students trying to take the class last semester, but our largest classroom only takes about 700. Last year, at one of the inauguration ceremonies for the minor, Vice President Al Gore spoke to the students and he talked about them as weavers. He said that when the fabric of the society and of the world is frayed, the role of the university is to weave it back together. This weaving, he argued, will have to be done by the next generation as they take on the task of combating climate change and combating global poverty. A few months ago, President Clinton also spoke to students in the minor, and he asked them to think about their work as belonging to a communitarianism but on a global scale. I teach the global poverty class as a conversation with millennials, this new generation. And in doing so, I try to carve out an impossible space between two extremes. On the one hand, there is what I call the hubris of benevolence. The belief um, on the part of well-meaning young Americans that they have the silver bullet to end global poverty. And on the other hand, the paralysis of cynicism. Young men and women directly who uh, believe that they are impotent in the face of power. I try to teach them how to craft and enact an ethics of global citizenship that is humble, engaged, and accountable. Let me close then with the point with which I started. That these are times of despair, but these are also times of hope. 
This is a time of incredible transformation and transition. Here in the U.S., the very foundations of middle-class American life have been shaken. From the dismantling of public education, with California as the ground zero for that dismantling, to the disappearance of stable jobs, to a devastating crisis of home ownership. Middle-class incomes are in their steepest decline in the U.S. in 40 years. At the same time, income inequality is, is at its highest in decades. Indeed, in this country, not since 1928 has the richest 1% of Americans held such a large share of the nation's income, nearly 25%. We have become a 1% nation, nurturing and coddling this enclave of wealth through bailouts and subsidies, what my colleague at Berkeley, Robert Reich, has called socialism for Wall Street, free markets for the rest of us. There's a very famous book in the poverty debate, William Easterly's The White Man's Dead. And in it, Easterly arguing against Jeff Sachs and the role of the state and the role of development institutions calls for a market approach to poverty. And he says, the rich have markets, the poor have bureaucrats. Judging by the American case, I have been talking about how the rich have state help, the poor have self help. The experiments with poverty alleviation that I briefly described, those in Bangladesh and those in Mexico and Brazil, show us that self-help is not enough. We need more robust forms of intervention in poverty and inequality. Especially important is how we choose to tackle systems of wealth, power and privilege. How we shake up that 1% economy. When translated in global terms, the 1% economy looks like this. That the world's richest 500 individuals, not even households, 500 individuals, have a combined income greater than the poorest 416 million people in the world. The millennials in our classroom are telling us that it is time to rethink the system, and I believe that the multiple crises upon us, from the financial crisis, the BP oil spill provide us with the patience for such action. Thank you. Thank you.